The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to Gate City Chronicles. I'm Kevin Avard, your host, and today we're going to be talking with Stephen Norton from the New Hampshire Center for Public Policy Studies. I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. And we've been wanting you on the show for a while now. Uh, I think it was uh, Sandra Zeem who had mentioned you in the, in the past, mm -hmm. and she uh, she's a county uh, commissioner. Yep, that's correct. County commissioner. And one thing I know about Sandra Zeem is she's very stickler for for facts and and when it comes to the penny, she, she's got it down to the penny. Yep. And I love her to death, and she's been a long, long time friend, and she speaks highly of you. That's nice. Thank you. Yeah. And one of the reasons she pointed, uh, pointed you out to me is because she said, you know, we have a problem. And uh, we've been knowing about it for a while, but it's, it's ready to, you know, come to roost. And, and it has to do with our aging population in New Hampshire. Correct? That's correct. So there is an economic crisis that is looming because of our aging population? Well, it's um, the way you, have, you think about New Hampshire, uh, back in 1968, there were 700,000 people in the state. So that's just 45 years ago, 50 years ago, and now there's 1.3 million. That population migrated from elsewhere. Some were born here, but a lot came from elsewhere. They're baby boomers, and now they're getting ready to retire. And so that big growth in population now represents the future picture for New Hampshire. And that future picture is one in which we are older, grayer, use more health care, um, are less productive, unfortunately, are going to be asked to extend our work years well beyond what we have historically done to maintain that productivity. And people are just starting to grapple with the implications of that. And so whether it's an economic crisis, I think, will depend on how we as communities respond, how the state responds, how the federal government responds. All right. And, and some of these... The issues are, well, there is a retirement. There's the, the, the unfunded liabilities with the pension fund. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you, know, social, you had mentioned uh, medical services and uh, the Medicaid expansion. And, you know, we were all decrying uh, socialized medicine years and years ago. But now that we're there, there is a consequence for it. And the taxpayers are going to have to pay for that Medicaid expansion. Uh, is that correct? So um, lots of different implications to the aging process, um, and I can take each one if that would be helpful. Yeah, and absolutely. Number one is there's a housing question. Oh. So um, we are a state that has built out very big houses, um, four-bedroom houses, um, suburban environments, um, and that's not really what older people demand for housing. They want smaller homes, easily managed, um, and at the same time, that's what young families want. So we're headed into an environment in which we're going to have young families competing with the older generation for housing. And the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority and others are really seriously beginning to struggle with how they reshape the housing stock in New Hampshire to meet this changing demand. Um, that's one thing. Um, two, with respect to medical services, you know as well as I that every year you get older, one more thing starts to hurt. <laughs> And occasionally you have to go to the doctor, and that becomes increasingly regular, unfortunately, my, my experience. And so we spend more money. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Some are arguing that as the number of uh, elderly increases and we spend more money on health care, that we are going to be um, creating an economic monster, which is the health care industry. The other option is that that's an industry. And it's bringing in resources from other parts of the country because it's federally funded in the, in the case of Medicare. So 
It's also the only place that has seen job growth in the United States, the only industry that's seen job growth in the, in the United States over the last 30 years. So there's a, two sides to that coin. Number one, it's probably true in Nashua. The healthcare industry is one of the biggest employers, largest source of comp compensation. So we have to walk that one fairly carefully. Mm. That, that does draw a question because uh, we've had uh, some conversations in the Senate about the certificate of need. Yep. And uh, I know that one of the senators was saying, well, you know, we, we, because, we don't have the, because we have the certificate of the need, there were 10 beds or, or, or hospital unit out in the London area area or uh, Franklin area needed a waiver from the certificate of need. Uh, and because of that certificate of need, it, it's, it's stopping the growth of the medical industry to provide certain amount of beds or, or whatever. And then there was another senator that said something to the effect, well, we don't want that competition. And I'm thinking, are you kidding? If our population is aging, we need the services. Is that mm -hmm. correct? We need the services, but you also want to encourage the systems to evolve and be entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And so there's a balance. Um, the certificate of need process hasn't demonstrated much cost savings across the country. It's very hard to prove that it was successful or unsuccessful. Interesting. But finding ways as a legislator or as a state to encourage organizations to be entrepreneurial and not a monopoly or to act as a monopoly is going to be very important. It's one of probably the, the most um, significant changes that are occurring right now is the consolidation of the healthcare industry, both in terms of hospitals, but also in terms of insurance companies. And it, it's reminiscent in my mind of the old steel days when we had these very large monopolies mm -hmm. that were uh, able to move price um, and weren't necessarily being um, entrepreneurial and it had to be antitrust which actually broke these organizations up. So um, I think c certificate of need is a tool, it's probably a tool that's um, It's in, supposed uh, to fade out. It, in the past, mm -hmm. um, but there are other avenues to think about encouraging entrepreneurial low prices, high quality um, through either the charitable trust function or um, through the antitrust function. Now as I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm gathering that you're very uh, you're very clinical in, in your discussion in, in the, uh, so you work for an organization that, that really is, you know, it's, not, it's not bipartisan, it's nonpartisan. That's right. To, we were created back in the 90s to provide information to legislators that was clean of a, an agenda so that we could describe the facts and then let folks fight it out. Mm -hmm. And that's often what happens. And that's a role that we played fairly successfully. It's not always... Uh, they're not always issues that you can step in the middle of. For example, we don't get involved in social issues because often those are about people's moral beliefs and, uh, and you can't really engage in a fact conversation about whether someone believes uh, that a social issue is right or wrong. But almost every other issue, you can put information on the table which eliminates bias, which gets rid of hyperbole, and allows the legislators and public policymakers to fight it out. And, uh, and when we're our most successful, which I think we give a couple of examples of, we walk into a room with people on both sides and we eliminate um, the rhetoric and allow them to get down to the brass tacks of the conversation. Um, gambling was one in which we played, I think, a very important role and that was we put information on the table which demonstrated that the folks that were anti-gambling were overstating the case and those that were programming were overstating the revenue implications. We walked in and said, yes, absolutely, there's an economic value to the state from a state revenue perspective and for certainly for wherever expanded gambling occurs. Uh, but there are also some social costs associated with those and they tend to be overestimated by a certain group. So that's the kind of role that we try and play. All right. And now, one of the things that we definitely want to talk about is, of course, our aging population. And yep. what, what would you say that... Uh, the top three priorities of our legislators to, to really consider this next session? Uh, That's a great, um, great question. So background a little bit. Number one, we're the third oldest state in the country. Is that right? Yeah. Only Maine and Vermont are older than us from a median age perspective. Our, our median age is 42, which doesn't feel too old to me. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, just a kid. <laughs> it's just a kid. That's exactly right. You think about places like Utah and Colorado which are 10 and 15 years younger than us. We start Generating to, revenue. We start to look um, uh, older. So in that context, you have to ask yourself, where are the workers going to come from? How are you going to support industry here 
or people who want to come to the state if we don't have a workforce that we can bring uh, to the table. So I think one of the most important questions that the legislature is going to have to grapple with is that workforce. How are we going to encourage or, uh, um, and unfortunately sometimes discourage, people from moving to the state who uh, are young, 30 to 40 year olds in their working prime? I think that's a really important one. Do you need a particular type of industry to bring them, or a multiple? Well, types you can. Of you, you. I think um, everyone, the governor, the Senate president, the Speaker of the House, they are all struggling to find the right mix of policies, which will re-engineer and rejuvenate the New Hampshire economy. Because for 30 years, we were one of the fastest-growing economies, one of the fastest-growing states in the country, and that slowed down considerably. And so, what does that mean? It means that you know you want to have affordable housing, and I don't mean workforce housing. I mean you want to have a home that's $210,000 that a, a, a family can come in and live in. And so that's the one piece. That's one aspect of the, of the, the aging question. Two um, is the housing question. How are we going to think about helping reshape the, the land use policies that encourage or discourage um, uh, the type of livable communities that older people want? Um, folks want to be close to health care. Folks want to be within walking distance of services. They want to live in vibrant communities. And there's a trend that's starting to occur in which these uh, older individuals are moving to cities from rural areas or more suburban areas. They're moving out of these places where they had four bedroom homes, and they're moving into the, what does that mean for a Concord or a Nashua? It means streets. It means infrastructure. More services. Right? More services um, and the like. So there's this housing. Um, question, which I really view as uh, making livable communities, allowing people to uh, live in this new world in which we've got such a high portion of our population over the age of 65. And then I think the final one, and the one that is, I think, really critically important for you to start really grappling with, is this question of public finance. One of the most um, under-discussed uh, aspect of the aging question here in New Hampshire is that we're going to see a very fundamental and large shift in the way the state supports its public long-term care system. And uh, where we right now spend a significant share of our resources for those under 65, in 15 years, we're going to spend most of our resources on those over 65. And the person that's going to be picking up that tab is the county long-term care system. This is where Sandra's scene that's comes correct. into play. <laughs> that's correct. And, and so I would say, it's just starting to make people anxious. And it's just start, they're just starting to realize that they're exposed, the counties, to some real financial exposure down the road for a very um, rapidly increasing portion of the population that will need their services. And they have the re restrictions that the state doesn't seem to have. They seem to run their, uh, the counties seem to run a little bit, uh, I don't know, if, if smoother is the right way, they, they can't. They can't budge things like the state can, I guess. I, I think uh, I'll leave the, the discussion <laughs> of, you know, um, uh, but I think, you know, bureaucracies all have their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And um, I think that one of the biggest problems in the long-term care question is that there's a real disconnect between the state and counties moving forward and that there has to be some activity which bridges the gap between uh, the county uh, commissioners and the county administrators and the state because the state maintains policy regulatory control, but they're not paying for it. Right. And so um, I think there's got to be some effort, some leadership played by the Senate, the House, the governor, and the counties to come together and begin to develop the, the system for the next 20 years. Well, one of the things that's being hailed as uh, the Hail Mary pass, of, you know, the help with the economic uh, problems, and I'm not so sure I agree with it. I, I'm not anti-rail, but... Mm -hmm. I'm not sure rail's the answer either. Everybody's saying, well, if we get, if we only had the trains to help the businesses uh, or the people from Massachusetts to come up here to New Hampshire, it, all, all our problems would be solved. Right. And I'm not sure, I still look at the facts, I'm thinking, that not necessarily true. And, and that's a $300 million question mark. Yep. And who's going to pay for it? And there's no guarantee with that. Uh, a lot of people are romantic about the rail and... Uh, I still see this exodus every morning coming from Concord mm -hmm. to Bill Recco, and, and it's, it's like stop and go. And then if you look at 93, it's the same way. Yep. 
Uh, so, I don't know, would the rail help them get out of town quicker? I, I'm not really sure. Uh, the studies that I've seen seems to indicate that if, if uh, an economy is booming, then rail is great. Mm -hmm. But if it's not booming, it's, it's, it's a boom doggle. Yep. And, and I'm not sure, is that one of the things that you had to study? So we are, we are um, starting to understand the implications of, or potential implications of rail for New Hampshire. Because if you look at the, the movement of um, individuals, businesses, um, they all go up at 93 and they all go up 89. So you can't underestimate the impact of transportation on the economy, mm -hmm. whether it's moving people or moving goods. Um, the, the question is, what's the best combination of transportation modes for, and I think we're not having that conversation. Right. Um, and I think that's the next conversation to have. How do you think about expanding 93 versus putting in a you know, a rail system um, up through Manchester or something like that. Those comparative analyses, I think, need to be done. And we do have a bus system that also That's is relatively successful, at least one of them anyway. Yep. Uh, how would that affect that? I mean, there's multiple That's effects. Right. So, uh, so no know. one's put it all together yet. And that's kind of what we're thinking about doing now is mm -hmm. how do you, um, there's no question that rail requires subsidization. Um, there's also no question that there's economic impact if you get people to move. Mm -hmm. and. The, the real question is, how many of those people are going to move? And what are the downstream implications of that for the state? So what are the direct and indirect job impacts um, for that? And so we're, we're starting um, that analysis. But you cannot um, argue with the fact that transportation is critical to our success. And a lot of people don't consider that. I mean, Nashville has a gem with our airport, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, there, that, brings, that generates a lot of revenue for our state as well, but mm -hmm. it, out of sight, out of mind. But that is another mode of transportation that is highly underlooked. Uh, I don't know if, yep. you, if you folks have considered um, that. We've been looking at um, the role of, in small metropolitan markets, the role of airports uh, to understand um, how, what public policies might support or inhibit activities that either fly out of Nashua or Manchester or, um, you know, we've lost some ridership in the, in the Manchester market and you wonder what that means you know for the the future of the market also but um, for the future of um, New Hampshire so uh, now there's another organization Charlie Arlinghouse yep. and uh, they're with yep. the Bartlett Society. Josiah Bartlett Center yeah uh, and you're a little bit different from them they're more of a private enterprise type they're of sort of a for uh, for profit uh, excuse me a um, a free market think tank I think is the way Charlie describes it and in New Hampshire there are really three major think tanks um, one is the State Fiscal Policy Institute, which tends to be focused on low and moderate income families. People would say that that's left-leaning. And then Charlie uh, Arlinghouse and the, the Josiah Bart Center, which is on the right more. Um, I think and Charlie would agree with that as Cato well. Cato versus uh, something else. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, um, I can't think of the organization on the left right now nationally. Uh, um, Center on Budget Policy Priorities. Um, and then we're, you know, arguably in the middle. And... Um, we try and stick to the facts uh, and don't pay attention so much to the politics. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, my board says we're doing a good job when both the right and the left are irritated with us because it means <laughs> we're just putting information out there that might contradict something that anybody's saying. Yeah. I do like the, uh, the philosophy of let the chips fall where they may yeah. uh, on a lot of things. Um, so our <laughs> aging population, our, our public financing of long-term care, um, that's a tough one. Yeah, uh, it is. And, um, you know, we, we as a state have faced crises like these before. And you're describing it as a crisis. Well, you think about what happened in the late 1990s um, around the Claremont lawsuit. Mm -hmm. That was essentially stating that the different communities had different capacities to support public education, and it was a state responsibility to support that um, uh, that that education, public education, um, across the state. Well, we have a similar policy, which says that we are required to provide nursing home services to anyone who's eligible with these services. And I think that we're headed to a situation in which these smaller rural communities can't afford it. The cost on a per capita basis of providing nursing home care in Coas County is three times what it is in Hillsborough because there are very few people up there to support the infrastructure. And so I think um, not only is it going to significantly increase, uh, and you know, it's anticipated that 
represents about a 4% per year increase in the county property tax if you were to just fund it through the counties. Um, but it's going to be almost uh, um, impossible for some of these more rural communities to support you know, their, that existing function. So there will be a policy conversation that goes on, but there's also going to be a fiscal conversation that goes on about whose responsibility is this, who's going to pay for it. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. So you're, you're diagnosing, but you're not necessarily the doctor in this situation. That's right. And I'm certainly not going to, I will put solutions on the table mm -hmm. if people ask. And I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we're going to have to rethink uh, one of two things, how and who we provide services to, or we're going to have to find additional money. And New Hampshire goes both ways. It has done that for the last 40 years. This is not the first time we've had a fiscal problem. We've generated additional revenues to meet those needs, and in times we've reduced spending so that we could meet those needs. But the, in a uh, the way. additional revenues could also mean uh, keeping our youth here in, in the state and, and getting them to work. That's true. And increasing there, our manufacturing base and our productivity. Yep, absolutely. And there's no question that um, there are uh, growth opportunities that the state has taken uh, advantage of over the last 10 years. The, the, whether you like or don't like the BPT and the BET, our corporate tax structure, um, it has provided most of the source of revenues for variety of issues that the state wants to. And now, of course, we're in a conversation about reducing that off into the future. So that we're competitive with Massachusetts and our surrounding states. I That's mean, we're right. We're the highest in, in the area. Yep, uh, and, no question. And if you drive down Massachusetts, it, look, there's growth everywhere. Yep. Everywhere. I mean, you, you can't drive down one of the major highways without seeing some type of uh, infrastructure being put up yep. uh, or, or building of some sort. And that, uh, good for them. We're not seeing that, that, that explosion of growth up here. We're not. And in fact, uh, for the first time in, for the last 40 years and the last three recessions, we're not leading the, the northern New England states out of that recession. And the question is, I don't think that any one change, the change in the BPT and the BET or sending some additional money to the university is going to answer th this question. I think there has to be a multi-pronged, multifaceted approach that it's on some of the key issues. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time. It's not something that's going to have an immediate impact. Yeah, we were actually just kind of going over the budget. To, and uh, one of the things that really stuck out, you know, instead of just level funding the universities at, at its normal pace, we had an 8% increase. And that kind of, you know, whoa, that's a lot of money. Uh, is that going to generate more jobs? I mean, granted, we're educating the kids, uh, the young people, but they're not staying. Yep. I think, I think the, the, prob the problem with the current budget conversation is that these are really important issues and they haven't been fully discussed. And they get politicized and then through that process it's polarizing. And you know, the, the people really need to know that, okay, this is a problem, but as soon as you say that, you know, then it's like, oh my gosh, you're, you're, you're not telling the truth about the facts. But when, when you have the facts in front of you, wait a minute. You know, is this gonna is this gonna really solve our problem? Are you gonna reduce the cost of education? And after they're educated, are they staying home? Yep. You know, we have a manufacturing base. I, I remember as a state rep, we, we were talking about the it's a long title of the education of manufacturers or something something like that. And it was a governor appointed uh, council, whatever. And and a lot of the uh, manufacturers that came before the committee said, look, we just need kids that can do simple arithmetic. Decimals, mm -hmm. you know, and of course now we're having the conversation about the Common Core and everything like that. But they're saying, look, we'll educate them. Just give us to them right out of high school, that ready to work. And they're saying that our workforce isn't ready out of high school. Uh, they'll we'll work. They can work for us with their little fingers doing their video games, you know, manufacturing things, and they'll start off thirty-five, seventy-five thousand dollars a year, and then after a couple of years into the workforce. They'll be ready for the college and for that extended math and stuff, and we'll pay for that. I heard that time and time again, and I'm not sure that I'm seeing any progress there. I think that you're absolutely right to question those things, and we, as a state, do a very poor job, and most states do. This is not just a, a problem in New Hampshire, of dealing with these holistic problems until there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I think we're within shouting distance of that crisis, whether it's a the public finance aspects of the aging of the population, or as you're pointing out, the workforce. We have uh, a problem, and that is that we're going to have to spend more money or find a different way of spending money on the long-term care population. And we're also in a situation where we probably 
are anticipating a 7% reduction in the workforce simply because people are going to be retiring. How do, you, how do you manage those? Right. You know, how do you manage those two things? Those are really two long-term important questions, and they're both the opposite sides of the aging question. So do you ever get to sit down in front of the governor or, or, or Senator Morris or, or the, the speaker and say, hey, look, you know, this is what we got? We, um, as an organization, every budget process, we're engaged in conversations. We write. We work with the Business and Industry Association. We work with... Um, the legislature, we work with local communities to try and help them understand what happens. And um, Senator Morse uh, has brought the center in to have conversations. Um, um, the governor has brought us in to have conversations. Um, we try and play that role until it's the politics, and then we step out of the room and... and <laughs> that's when all the hair pulling goes <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. And the Medicaid expansion question is a perfect example of that. This is a, um, you know, a very complicated policy question that... Uh, Taken, no one has taken a holistic look at it yet. Um, we know that there are estimated 40,000 individuals that are newly enrolled in the Medicaid program. We uh, suspect that that has a big financial impact on the hospitals, but we don't know what that is yet. We suspect that that has some implication on the individuals, but we don't know yet what the implication is. And there's a movement to expand it without having all this information. And that's the problem I'm having with this. Mm -hmm. And I, that's always a red flag for me. You know, why do you want to extend it when we don't even have the information that we need in order to find out the value of it? Um, well, there's all, obviously lots of politics going on in this conversation, and I, and I won't speak to that, but um, the, the, the decision to move forward was one that was based on a set of facts that we don't know the answers to, and unfortunately, I'm not sure that you will know the answer to them in time to re-up uh, if, if you were interested in doing that. These programs take time to have an impact. It's likely that you'll have a pretty good sense of the financial impact on the, the healthcare delivery system, which I would anticipate to be large and not small. But in terms of actually affecting individuals' health, these types of proposal changes take longer time. Well, we had a, a long uh, discussion about the workers' comp uh, industry, mm -hmm. and uh, it was Senator Daniels that was trying to come up with some type of uh, a program that would uh, give the medical society incentive to drop the rates because they're, they're astronomical. And, and we have one senator say, they're gouging us. <laughs> you know, they're gouging us. Yeah. And it's not only been for years, it's been for many years. And uh, others would say, well, no, and it's a complicated issue, and you can't do it in a half-hour show, obviously. But uh, that was something that fell by the wayside. But that's another thing that's, that's hurting industry in New Hampshire is, is the high workers' comp. Yep. Um, there are, I think there needs to be more transparency in the healthcare system, and, and we just scratched the surface um, and can only scratch the surface here today, but there, is, um, there are organizations that are trying to empower businesses to empower their, their, their workers to be better consumers of healthcare so that they understand price and what that really means, and the same thing is going on with workers' comp. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire um, is in the middle of a very high-cost healthcare region. Right? Massachusetts is very costly. Vermont, very costly. Maine, very costly. So this, the second point that I would make is, while our input costs are expensive and workers' comp is expensive, who are we competing with? Are we competing with North Carolina? Are we competing with Texas? Are we competing with Massachusetts? What is the sweet spot for New Hampshire um, from an economic development perspective? I remember there was a gentleman in a Nashua Chamber event. And I can't remember. It was Peter Antoinette. And I realized that a lot of New Hampshire's success was poaching businesses out of Massachusetts into southern New Hampshire or keeping those businesses in southern New Hampshire who were thinking about moving to Massachusetts because of the labor force, access to the labor force. So how are we going to find and what are the set of policies that we're going to go after that allow us to compete effectively with Massachusetts if that's what we're going to do or North Carolina? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to be very you know, blunt about it, if I, I doubt we can compete with North Carolina because the costs are half what ours are from an electricity perspective and healthcare perspective. That's another one is the energy. You know, we in, in my district, uh, District 12, uh, I've been a very big pro advocate of property rights. I, I just, I, it's, if you don't have property rights, I believe liberty is, is academic at that point. Uh, if you, if, if a big corporation can come in and say, look, we're going to put a pipeline underneath you. You know, that, that destroys a lot of what I believe that we stand for. 
However, we have an energy crisis in, in Hampshire, and yep. we're part of the grid, if you will. Uh, yep. uh, and, and that being said, I know the governor is, is very much for the pipeline, you know, mm -hmm. because it's going to lift all ships. But at the same time, my district doesn't want to go into their backyard where we don't benefit directly. Right. Uh, yeah, this is a very simple thing, actually, from an economics perspective, and that means you need to be compensated for whatever increased risk or costs you have associated with that and that's uh, exactly. and that's and that's what you know across the country that's what these processes are moving towards is recognizing that you will never get away from the not in my backyard the nimby issue with these types of projects <coughs> uh, there are some additional costs there are some potential um, additional exposures and they need to be monetized and you need to be compensated that's part of the property rights and, and, and the, I guess the setting the value and of course you know having that Yep. You know, we know that some of the, the gas is going to go overseas, and, and, you know, we understand that there's a, a global problem there as well, and, and, and we have some security issues. Uh, but if, if the pipeline only goes through a corner of your, your, your lot and it, it somehow the, takes away from the equity or makes it hard to sell, uh, should it be three times or four times? And that's what we propose, that it, it's, uh, you know, you, you condemn the whole property or take the whole value of the property and make it three times the, the value. Uh, that didn't that didn't fly over too well, yep. uh, because they're going to be they're going to make the money anyway. It seems, but uh, I have to listen and represent the people, and, and in my district they don't want it. So the senator says no, and mm -hmm. I have to listen to them because that's why they elected me. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's their voice, then that's what we're going to do. We know the state of New Hampshire needs to lower the cost of energy. Now we have the same problem up up north with the Northern Pass. Correct. So we have a pipeline that nobody wants buried. And we have power lines that nobody wants. That everyone wants buried. <laughs> Everybody wants buried. <laughs> right. And, and are, are you struggling with these issues too? We do, absolutely. Um, the question is, Massachusetts energy costs are just as high as ours. Why are they competitive and we're not? And they didn't want the pipeline either. That's right. And so, again, to my point, energy is not the only reason why we can't compete. Healthcare is not the only reason. The, work, the labor force is not. So any way we can chip at all of these problems, because we're not, frankly, going to solve the energy pro problem. We're always going to be more expensive than some place that uh, doesn't. But Massachusetts has much more, many more efficiency standards, and so their, uh, their costs are lower on a per capita basis than ours are. Um, so there are things that we can do that will lower it. There, the, the natural gas pipeline would be a game changer. But it strikes me we're a ways away from whether that's going to happen or not. Uh, there, there are a few pipelines that uh, say they can augment without any environmental impact, and that's that, that's fantastic, and yes. I hope that happens. Uh, but uh, we did uh, consider proposing, uh, you know, the water being a natural resource, and, and boy, the loggers came out against that because of the hydro, mm -hmm. and they didn't want it because they they said that would affect their industry. There's no quick fix for right. anything. There's always going to be somebody that's affected by, by by something when a new bill comes comes up, and yep. you try to solve it with, oh wait, wait a minute, this is. This is easy. We just make this definition that the uh, water is a renewable energy source. Well, you can't do that because it's going to harm the logging or the pulp, or according yeah. to them. I think you know to bring it back to the question of aging. The the, the all of these issues um, requ require in their solution New Hampshire to be a vibrant, yeah. um, diverse, economically uh, vibrant place, and so identifying that these are issues is one thing, and two, identifying how you're going to ensure that we have the resources or the policies in place um, is really going to be a hard struggle over the next five years. And it's not, it's not going to just come up this time. When you think about the fact that you know, as many as 25 or 30 percent of the state's population could be over the age of 65 by in 15 years, that's, that's a big change. That's a, a big demand, a big um, change in the workforce, a big change in demand for housing, a big change in demand for health care, touches everything. Just as energy, excuse me, just as, you know, everything seems to be affected by aging, mm. aging affects everything. Oh, interesting. And I really appreciate you coming on the Thanks show so to talk about these myself. things. Uh, you think you could come back at another time? Absolutely. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, we hope that uh, the show is very informative to you. As you can see, there, there's no quick answers. Uh, there are a lot of things that we have to plow through and struggle through. And, of course, the politicians like to pull each other's hair over it and throw mud. 
Uh, but the, at least we have a few organizations out there that are crunching the numbers. And uh, Stephen, I really appreciate you doing that for thanks us. Thanks so much. All right. Until next week, thanks for watching Gate City Chronicles. We'll see you then. Thank you for watching Gate City Chronicles. And we want to thank our sponsor, Aardvark Cleaning. They've been a sponsor for quite a few years now, and uh, we appreciate them being a sponsor. And if you want to be a guest on our show, contact accessnashua at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story. Until next week, thanks for watching. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.